Your name is Vincent A. Beliso. B E L I S O. Good American. Uh, yeah, good, 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 <laughs> good Roman. <laughs> where, where did you grow up? I was born in Belmont, New Jersey, and my folks had a farm. I was six months old, and they moved back to Philadelphia. All my brothers and sisters, there were five of us. The other four were born in Philadelphia. I was the only one born in New Jersey. In New Jersey. Well, that's where and, my, um, my uh, great-grandfather came out of New Jersey. Okay. And, farmer and, back there. And Delmon is near Cape May, which yeah. gives you a better idea. And uh, I was raised basically in Philadelphia and uh, went to school in Philadelphia. Um, I graduated high school when the war broke out. In, in, I was serving my apprenticeship when I was in high school. You as go a tool ahead, you, and die you maker. Talk to me. You don't, don't worry about this. Okay. As a tool and die maker. And, uh, and then the war broke out in uh, December 7, 1941. And prior to that, Franklin, President Roosevelt, you know, we were in a major depression and times were tough. We, I was raised on the other side of the tracks. We were struggling to survive just to get enough to eat. And uh, 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 from 35, 36, 37, 36, 37, 38, my father, whole, whole family used to go over to New Jersey and used to go uh, on a big farm and work and pick. And we used to make enough, he used to make enough money to pay off the grocery bill, who was a friend of his. We used to run six, seven hundred dollars, but we would make enough money. And all the kids worked. My youngest brother was five years old. So me and my mother were the fastest pickers there were, and I was only 11 years old, and I used to compete with my mom. But we'd be way ahead of everybody else. And my older brother would take the full baskets back to the road edge. My younger, my five-year-old brother would bring up the empty baskets. So everybody worked. You know, and that's how, that was how you survived. What were, did, what were you picking? Did it change? What oh, yeah, picking? we picked strawberries, cher uh, uh, string beans, lima beans, cherries, potatoes. Uh, you know, it was big. It was colony. It was big, big. He was a big farmer. And uh, I could always make two bucks a day, even if the beans were uh, uh, third picking. One day, I picked 52. I made $6. Can you imagine what $6 was during the Depression? God. And I always was good for two bucks, so, you know, it, it, it just putting it in perspective. If you, made, if you made $15 a week, you could raise a family back during them days. You know, that's all it took because we were on welfare, too, and, and uh, I like what Roosevelt did. It wasn't welfare. It was relief. And the government used to come and assess your family, and... Uh, and uh, uh, we had five, there were five kids, five of us, my mother and father, and they assessed us at $15 a week. So the government used to send you a check, government check. And one check went for paying the rent because we lost, my mother and father lost the house over $40. The, yeah, 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 and you know, we had two relatives that were well off. You think you can borrow $40 from them? Forget it. And so we lost the house, so we, we rented. And so one check went for paying the rent. The rent was $15 a month, all during the Depression. And so my father, who could, he couldn't, my father couldn't read or write, uh, didn't speak English, speak Italian. And my mother, she went to school here. She came, they both came over in 1906. Uh, my mother landed, my grandfather came here on my mother's side in, 19, in 1896 or something like that. So she landed in Philadelphia. My father landed in New York. He was 25 when he came over. And so he came to Philadelphia in 1919. He met my mother. They got married, and, and uh, that, that's how that all Well, now my mother wanted to be a nun. But at that time, she was too petite. She was only four feet six. 98 pounds. To be a nun, you had to be big. But she, so she went to fourth grade or fifth grade, and she spoke, uh, read and write English, and spoke. she used to read to us all the time. And so she used to be the interpreter for the Italians who couldn't speak, uh, you know. Where I came from was in North Philadelphia, Port Richmond. And that 
if you were in South Philly, they were all Italians. If you were in Fishtown, they were all Irish. If you were in Breisberg, they were all Polish. If you were in Germantown, they were all German. But in Fort Richmond, we were all mixed. Russians, Japanese, Italians, uh, you name it, uh, Irish, uh, uh, English, the whole works. And that was, a, at that time, we didn't realize what an asset that was. Uh, you know, really, today you look at that and say, geez, what? What a nice background. And so, you know, we're on the other side of the tracks. And uh, uh, the people were all hardworking. And all the people, everybody was bilingual. You know, Jewish. We had, you know, I was in the Jewish neighborhood. And everybody was bilingual. And the uh, folks come from overseas, most of them couldn't, never did speak English, see. So the kids, so I used to play with Janek, who was Polish, and and so we would be playing, and they were having supper, and the mother would say, come on in and eat. And then you learned their customs, their habits, their diets, in the same way we would, or, or with German kids. So it was all mixed. And we fought together in the whole work, which was very interesting. So then the war broke. You know, My father insisted that I don't care what you do. And he couldn't, I said, he couldn't read or write, didn't speak, but he's very psychic. He said, as long as you don't know how lucky you are living in this country, the schools are free. Over there, you had to pay to go to school back in them, way back in the 18s. And he said, as long as school's free, you're going to go. And I'll break your skull. And believe me, I couldn't go home and tell my father, the teacher hollered at me. God, all I had to say that, he'd drive me through the wall. So, so we got an education. We went, all of, our, all of my brothers and sisters, we all finished high school. So the war broke out. And, and in 1940, uh, President Roosevelt was having a very, very difficult time trying to convince the American people about preparing for war, what was going on. You know, the English were getting the shit, it was getting the head kicked out of them. And, and uh, Roosevelt then came up with the Lend-Lease. Finally, in 1940, he came up with the draft, which took the 21-year-olders. And it was supposed to be go, you know, only 21-year-olders. Well, then the war broke out on December 7th, 1940. 41, Japanese bombed Pearl Harbor. So then they drafted, okay, then in, in November of 42 or February of 43, uh, then Congress passed to take the 18-year-olders. And the 18-year-olders were not supposed to uh, go to combat. Don't believe it. <laughs> so... So I was just finishing high school, graduating high school, 18 years old. And so in September, uh, uh, you know, I got a notice from the president, you, you are selected, you, you know, to serve. And uh, so uh, I, wanted to, I wanted to be a pilot, and I wanted to be in the Air Force. I never flew an airplane. No, none of us ever flew airplanes, and I did the first wheel. So... So I volunteer induction, and I was drafted in uh, September of uh, 1943. Went to Fort Meade. From Fort Meade, they put me in the Army Air Corps. And I went to Miami Beach. They sent us to Miami Beach, Florida. I got lucky. I got sent to Miami Beach, Florida for basic training. Well, I'll tell you, you take a kid from the other side of the tracks, never seen nothing. And put on a train. When that train, in the morning, that train stopped in Miami proper and got out of the train. And I couldn't believe it. I thought me and Bing Crosby were, you know, Hawaii, <laughs> coconut trees, uh, flowers, flamingos. It's like paradise. And I said, God, Vince, you landed in the paradise. Then they took us across Bispane Bay onto Miami Beach. And we were in those hotels right on the beach. $30 a day rooms, the, the Air, Corps, Air Corps took over the whole thing. And that's where I did my basic training. So, so you were what, 19, 18 years ago? 19. 19. I just turned 19. Have you ever been away from New Jersey to that point, or Philly? Oh, oh yeah, well, I went down to Maryland to uh, work on a farm one time. But this is like. Yeah, oh yeah, time, oh yeah. This else, is, you've been away. Well, like I said, when I got out of that train, I could, and I do with bananas on the tree. <laughs> I said, I said, man, oh man. You, you know, you remember the movies about Hawaii with Bing Crosby, and I said, God, I landed in paradise, which was interesting. 
Now, so, how, how aware of the war were you at this point? Because here you are, you know, high school. Oh, we were very aware. Okay, so you oh, were yeah. even out there. Oh, oh, yeah, we used to follow it constantly. So, you know, the, the, the papers, you know. Uh, and then when you got into the service, you got the Stars and Stripes, you, you know, which is a, a fantastic paper. And they had a gripe column in there, which was the best thing there ever was. And so what happened is uh, I did doing 13 weeks of basic training. Well, I, I, uh, I was uh, in high school, I was captain of the tumbling team. And it was interesting. Back then, all the athletes, all you got was a big letter. If you were on the varsity team, you got a big letter of the school. Mine was a big M for Red Bob. <laughs> You know, but you didn't get no one like today. God, they're they're paying a million. That's baloney. Got to go back to the whole the whole system. So what happened is um, is uh, I uh, I passed the uh, AC sixty four the physical, and there you had to have perfect vision. Well, I was uh, one top one percent health wise, you know, and you had to do depth perception. So I passed that. Then you had to pass the test cost, the AC-20, which was a written test. Uh, and most of the people I were with were National Guards or had a year of college already, and I just a high school grad. But I was good at math, and that's what helped me the most. And so I passed that. You had to have 170, and I got 175. I just made it. You know, and I was competing with these guys that already were, had college background. And so I then went in front of the board, and I had a friend from uh, Pittsburgh. Uh, people from Pennsylvania are funny. They're very great people. And, and this guy, he's German. Charnloger was his name. And he knew about airplanes, and he flew. And so he was educating me. So when I went to the board, that's how I passed the board. You had to have identification of the different airplanes, what they were. And so I passed the board, and I was then... Uh, selected for uh, 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 candidate school for for uh, pilot school for college, and, and then you go to college. Well, in November of '43, uh, the Ar the Army decided they had too many pilots and navigators and bombardier already in the chain in the chain, so they uh, eliminated 30,000, and I was one of the 30,000 of us. I even went to the chaplain and I said, you know, I passed all the, I passed the board. I had already passed the board. I was already slated for it to go. And they were going to send me to Georgia Tech, you know, when, the, when I was done the basic. Well, they eliminated it. So I wound up at gunnery school in Tyndallfield, Florida. And uh, there I was top of the class again. And, uh, and uh, so I wound up for two weeks at Apalachicola. And that was night. Nice. That was great, dude. You're starving. In, in Tyndall Field, and, and yeah, it's funny, that was all swamps. Now it's a, now it's a resort. Uh, un unbelievable how time changes. And uh, so th at, uh, at the Apalachicola, we had garrison rations, which was terrific. And that's where I got the first fly. And it was funny, uh, they had these AT-18s Lockheed. They were Lockheeds, uh, and they were uh, two, two engines. So the, the, the morning... That morning, we were to fly. I was scheduled to fly. They put us on the airplane, and uh, so the airplane going down down the runway, and and uh, and I said to the uh, sergeant instructor, I said, "When are we going to get out? Get off the ground?" He says, "Look out the window." <laughs> well, I looked out the window, and boy, you could. I'll tell you, that was such a thrill. I was so, and I just loved it, and and, and that was it. And so, then then when I got done gunnery school. Went to Salt Lake City. Well, I went on furlough. Then I went to Salt Lake City, Utah. And uh, that's where we picked up our crew. Picked up our crew in Salt Lake, and we wound up in Sioux City, Iowa, for uh, advanced uh, fighter, for advanced training, phase training, on the B-17s. And, uh, and so then when we got done, we spent about three months there, and we were flying air-to-air -air, uh you know, firing, you know, targets or ground affair, you know, and bombing. And, and so when we got done that, we went to Kearney, Nebraska, and picked up our B-17, and we flew across to England. And we flew from Kearney, Nebraska, 
to uh, Manchester, New Hampshire. Well, when we got there to take off, we started out for Prescott Island. Well, we couldn't make it, so we had to turn back, and we wound up back in Bangor, Maine. So then we stayed in Bangor, Maine. When the weather cleared, we finally wound up in Greenland. From Greenland, we went to Iceland. From Iceland, we were supposed to go to Scotland, but we the weather again, so we wound up in Chester, Wales at an English... That was interesting. It was an English Air Force base. I'm telling you, there were 900 women. There were no men because they were all, you know, and they were the mechanics and everything. And so we were there a week, and we had a ball. And uh, uh, we had uh, our crew chief. He was so anxious to to go. And I said to him, what are you so anxious to get killed, you know, to go into combat? So finally we wound up with the 303rd Bomb Group, and we were in the 427 Squadron. And uh, then uh, my first mission was the 2nd of August, 1944. And what happened, uh, the invasion, because we, we were following this, uh, the invasion happened on June the 6th. Uh, that was one heck of a... Well, the Air, 8th Air Force was bombing two missions a day, you know, uh, to, for the breakthrough. Well, they were... Uh, uh, after we... Uh, made the landing and established the beachhead. They had the hedge groves, and and uh, and uh, there were two row of hedges, and and the germs would be in. And so some guy, some farmer from Iowa or someplace, he came up the idea with a cricket. You know, yeah, what do you call those things? Uh, crickets, ain't it? Cricket. Yeah. yeah, and you click. So uh, when he would click it, if a guy clicked, he knew there were Americans in there. If he got no click, he knew there were Germans in there. And the Germans never caught on <laughs> to, to, to that. So th what they had done is they leveled St. Lowe, the town of St. Lowe. And so that thing became a fortress for the Germans. And they couldn't pen. So, the a so we, the 8th Air Force, then bombed St. Lowe. And what they did, they bombed it with... Um, Hundred, uh, they were carrying uh, 40 hundred pound bombs, 120 pound bombs. They were six to a cluster, and when they went down, the cl the band would break, and there would be six 20 pounders, and they were anti personnel. They were pricking the Germans up three days later, and they were still shaking, and that was the breakthrough. And then, and then from there, they were head on to Paris, and that's when Patton then came in after Saint Lo. And what happened at St. Lo is uh, they use smoke flares for the markers. Well, what happened is the wind, instead of blowing from the west to the east, it blew from the east to the west. So it went over our troops, and we wound up killing a bunch of our troops, and we killed General McNair. That's where General McNair got killed, because the shift. Well, after that, we never used that no more. Then they came up with the uh, with the uh, 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 beam signal, which was we knew where the front line was all the time, so that when you passed the front line, it would switch over from gold, gold to blue, or vice versa, whichever way it was, and that way you would know you were over the Allied troops, so we weren't bombing our troops no more. See, and. Uh, and then, uh, then I wound up uh, uh, bombing Caen, France. Uh, prior to the invasion, the 8th Air Force had, had destroyed, had bombed out all the bridges across the Seine River in France. So that way the Germans couldn't, couldn't difficult for them to trans, uh, transfer troops across the, river, the Seine River. And uh, so then the Montgomery was supposed to go north through Belgium and Holland and that way. And uh, uh, the uh, U.S., the Patton and them were going east to Czechoslovakia. And uh, so Montgomery was stuck in Caen. And so we wound, I wound up on that mission. We bombed Caen. And I got pictures in there of what Caen looked like. We were there last summer. So they have a beautiful, you never know that there was ever, ever a bomb drop. And so I had a poster card of the bombing and the, the steeple of the church that was left. And I said to my wife, God, I said, look at that. I said, what I need now is a comparison. And I got what the city looks like today. You couldn't, I can't even tell it was ever a bomb drop. 
So I have that, and 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 I I Amazing. showed that. I wanted to show that to get to show what bombing. Uh, uh, I mean, we we flattened the place, you know. Uh, you see, and I thought that was important. Then we went to we went to Normandy, and then and then you take a look at Utah Beach. There's Omaha and Utah, and that cliff is a hundred feet straight up. And those poor infantry guys had to get up over that cliff to establish a beachhead. And they got slaughtered. You know, we lost, what, 60,000 men? Those LSD, some of them uh, uh, didn't go in far enough, and they were short. And when those uh, infantry guys, they had 60-pound packs, they went down. They couldn't swim. They drowned. We lost a lot of them, you know. And uh, uh, that picture by uh, Saving Private Ryan, I think Steve Spielberg did a beautiful job. He came the closest to picturing what happened and the tough job it was, you know. And then after St. Lo, then Patton came in with his Third Armored Division and they went on to Paris. And now, was your was your squadron one of the ones going over St. Lo? Was that one of your? Oh yeah, oh yeah. yeah. I wasn't there. I wasn't yet there. I I didn't. I that was because before, you, you, yeah. before that was that was on. I've the, interviewed. Uh, that was on the twenty fourth of July. My first mission was August the second, on in nineteen forty. And again, where were you in the plane? You were uh, a tail gunner. Tail gunner. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, always... So you've got to crawl back in, not malter it, right? You're you're. Um... Well, what happens is, when we take off, you take off in your position, and you and we always put a, a cartridge in the chamber. You had to do that because it. That altitude, it was minus 67 degrees below zero. If the gun, if the 50, I had two 50 calipers. If they froze up, then they wouldn't fire. So if you had a ground in the chamber, you fired it, that would break it loose and, and you're okay. So, but you flew off, except the ball gunner. You flew off in your position because he had to get up airborne first before he could. Then get in and then yeah. So. Now you're pretty isolated where you are. Though, oh right? yeah, I'm all by myself. I mean, you're... Oh yeah, yeah, I'm, you know, yeah. And then there's a fuselage. And you got the waist gunner. Oh yeah, I'm all by myself back there, just like the ball gunner underneath. That's one thing we lose perspective of. You, you gave the key thing. So what do you say? Sixty-seven degrees below zero. Zero. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's when you see movies, you don't think about. That's why I I showed that thing where the dress the dress. You had silk gloves, and then you had the uh, the, the regular gloves on, because if you touched if you touched the, the metal or the gun with your hand, you, you, you're going to lose all the meat. You, you, you're, you're just at that temperature, you're you're you're, you're going to lose your, your 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 meat, your flesh. How long did it? Let's say a, a day of a mission. How long did it take you to get dressed and get into your position? Well, what happened is around 1.30 in the morning, the sergeant would come around and, and say who, who was on the mission. And, uh, and so you would then get up and you would go to breakfast. Then you would go to briefing. Okay, so you had breakfast and you, know, you went to the priest or whatever you wanted to. And then you had the briefing and there... One thing interesting about combat, they did not lie to us. We knew where everything was. We knew where the front lines were. We were there. You know, we were it. So, so there, and they told you the target, what to expect, how much flak, fighters, you, you know. And, and so they would, they, you know, had these big maps, and they would show you where you were going, the route. And, and, then, and then you would go out to the area, to your airport, to the airplane, where the airplane you were going to fly. And you flew different airplanes. We were not, we did not have the same airplane. It could be, you know, because, yeah, like I said, there were four squadrons to a bomb group. And in the 303rd, there was the 360th, the 359th, the 358th, and the 427th. I was in the 427th. And we were isolated. We were on the other end of the airfield, okay? And, and so 
when they flew the missions, only three squadrons flew at a time because you always kept one down as a reserve in case they got wiped out. You still had, and there were 13 planes to a squadron that flew combat. See, so you didn't know what planes, you know, every time you went on a mission, it would be a different airplane. And that'd be 13 B-17s or 13 total with it? So no, 39 total. 39 total. 13 okay. per squadron. So that's 39. And we were flying 1,000 short T's a day at that time. So, and we were losing 60 to 100 airplanes a day. So you figured out 10 men on a crew, 60, that's 600 men a day. Or, 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 or a thousand men a day. And the 8th Air Force has the highest casualty, missing in action, prisoners of war of all the services put together. The Marines, the Army, the Navy, the CVs, the Coast Guards, and they have the highest, uh, it, 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 it's statistics, it, it's a known fact. Are you aware of that while you're there? No. I mean, or no, all we knew, all we were aware of that we were losing 60, 60 or 100 planes a day. Do you try to block that out? No, you, you know, you, you were, we were different. Uh, we were patriotic. You know, we were fighting. You know, you, you know, it was hard to believe why we were fighting the Germans, you know, uh, especially since I was serving my apprenticeship under a couple Germans, you know, and I thought, that, you know, they were great people. Always had high respect, you know, and and couldn't believe this Hitler thing until, and thought it became a prisoner of war. And boy, that was true. And the Holocaust and all—that's all true. That they, I mean, they had he had ten million slave laborers. See, he he made so many mistakes. The biggest mistake he made is when he lit into Russia. You know, first they made a pack and they took a Poland. See. I mean, he he cleaned, you know, he, he defeated the French and the poor English were fighting all by themselves. And then when he turned on Stalin, he went into Russia. He went into the Ukraine. The Russian people, the Ukrainians, thought he was coming to liberate them from communism. They didn't want to be under communism. Well, hell, he enslaved them. He made slave laborers out of them. He put them in boxcars in those... Forty and eight boxcars. He put a hundred. Half of them died. You know. Well, somebody escaped. You know, and they got back, and they said, "Hey, this guy didn't come to liberate us. This guy came to enslave us." And that's when the Russians then became, how do you say, patriotic in the defense of their country. You know, see, and and that's how Stalin was able. Uh, you know, but if he did, if he would not have done that. He'd have had all of Russia. Yeah, if he if he said he was liberating them, oh God, he had it made. But the same way he did North Africa, I mean, with uh, uh, John, uh, General uh, uh, Rummel's, uh, he was the he was the smartest general in the war. Uh, you know, uh, he never did supply the guy with what he needed. And, yeah. You know, so it was the, it was basically though it was the American. People, the ladies, the rovers, the riveters, uh, uh, we were not affected basically by bombing and stuff. And the mass production, it was the amount of material that we could produce. And of course, we were supplying all our allies, you know, with, with the English and us. And, the, and the, what stopped the uh, uh, yeah, general... Uh, Rumstead, uh, no, General uh, uh, Rommel's, was our, 80, our 90 millimeter cannon. See, because the Germans had that Ju-88. That, that was a fantastic piece of, a, of armament. It could be used for artillery. It was used for any aircraft. It was used for tanks. They were on the tanks. There ain't no way, you know. So our 90 millimeter was able to stop the German tanks, see, because it was in the same class as the 88. Our, our General Sherman tanks had a 75 millimeter. One German tank could stand off 35 German tanks with no, and, and the German, and the, the Tiger tank had a 360 degree rotation, you know, so.
Mm. On and on. Technology was a, I mean, yeah. a big oh, oh, yeah. part oh, of oh, that. Oh, yeah. oh, he, they had, he had, oh, God. You know, you know he, uh, if he'd have listened, <laughs> you know, they, they had the first, I remember on the 4th of August, we were flying on a mission, and there was an airplane out there, and it was an ME-262. That was a jet. And the P-51s came out of the clouds, and they were, you know, we're flying here, and he was way out over there, see, and he was flying. And our fighters came out of the sky after him. All of a sudden, and he was gone. I, we couldn't believe it. So in the interrogation, we had to report all of this stuff. I mean, that guy just, and, and, and he left the 51s. <laughs> see, and then I seen the uh, ME-163. That was the, the rocket job, you know, the one, the single engine. And they, see, they were flying on hydrogen peroxide. And uh, they didn't have fuel, you know, uh, 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 a lot of fuel. You know, they, they, they can only fly so many minutes and, and you know, and, and then they were out of fuel. Yeah, which see, makes it a little tough. Yeah, which makes it a little <laughs> tough, yeah. But if he'd have developed those, wow. Well, that's it, yeah. I mean, that's uh, our, there's but, a lot of... Yeah, he didn't, he didn't, he never listened to nobody, you know, he... Uh, he didn't listen to his general. Where were you? What was your mission when you got shot down? How, what number? Oh, my twenty fourth. Uh, uh, I uh, uh, I bombed uh, on my fourth mission. I bombed um, Petamundi. Uh, what happened there is uh, the uh, Canadians intelligence. They had a captured a, a German colonel. And they had him, I, I've been up there at Asaga Beach uh, in Canada. That's um, west of Toronto. And uh, uh, the intelligence there, and, you know, and he was talking, uh, you know, he got talking about back home, it was like where he was at, you know. So it didn't take the intelligence long to figure out where this guy was at. And they knew who he, who he was, you know. And so they figured that's where uh, Von Braun and company were doing the, the V-2 rockets, see? Because the V-1 was, a, was a, uh, an engine, you know, had it. And, and uh, I was in London when those things used to come over. And when they stopped, you knew they were dropping. Uh, yeah, and they, and they go, ooh, ooh, ooh. Then when they stopped, you knew they were falling down. And, and they, they, wherever they landed, well, the V-2... They never knew because they shot those, and they went up a hundred. You know, they went up a hundred miles, and then they come down. And but they weren't stable. They didn't have the guidance like they have today on the rockets. See, and uh, so they found out that where they were developing that was at Penamundi, and that's about close to Sweden. See, so we went on that mission. And uh, we bombed uh, Penamundi. Well, it was funny, just on the side, when I was uh, putting, I was project manager in Mississippi for the Saturn V program. We were putting in the uh, test stands for static fire in the first and second stage of the, uh, pilot, of the Saturn V for the Apollo shot, for the moon shot. And uh, I was project manager, and I was having a problem with the QA people. I had the high-pressure gas and the cryogenic systems. I had a 500,000 gallon liquid hydrogen and 500,000 gallon liquid oxygen and 50,000 gallon liquid nitrogen. And I had 6,000 PSI underground piping for delivering gas to the, to the test stations. And this QA guy he was giving me a, when they wrote the spec, whoever wrote the spec, he picked it out of the, out of the uh, engineering book and he said that the, 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 the manufacturers couldn't produce a, enough liquid nitrogen. So you had to clean everything at level one. And, uh, and so what happened is um, uh, 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 he was going by the spec minus 140 degree dew point. Well, all the manufacturer could make was 80 degree dew point. And that was good. That was. So I disagreed. I got into it with him. And I, so... I used to go back and forth to uh, from uh, uh, Slidell. I, I lived in, in Long Beach in Mississippi to Huntsville, and I used to meet with Von Braun and company 
because my uh, one of my major professors, Professor Zucro, was uh, from Purdue, was consultant to von Braun. He was uh, one of the leader pioneers in rocketry uh, under when Scott uh, came up with uh, with uh, with uh, liquefied rockets, and uh, and so. Uh, 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 Dr. Tessman, who was cohort to Von Braun, came down. And so we sat down at the table, and I said, it's impossible, and I can't deliver the nitrogen, this QA, this stupid QA guy. <laughs> and, and so he took a look at it, he says, and I said, you know, all the manufacturing can do, he took a look at that, and he says, golly, he says, it's not right, he said, you're right, Vince. And he had the authority. He changed the spec right there, signed his name. So we got talking. I said, hey, Dr. Tessman. I said, you were at uh, Penamundi. He says, yeah. I said, uh, I bombed you on the 4th of August. <laughs> he said to me, yeah, you missed. I said, yeah, but we scared the hell out of you. <laughs> and we became very good friends. So I used to relate with those guys. It was interesting. And, and then, you know, and so then... We did do what Kennedy, he was a, Kennedy was a smart man, and we got to the moon as a, as a great program. I don't know why we stopped. I, I, I can't never figure out what our government does. Uh, we had the system. We should have developed a, a station up there. We had the technology. And what happens is it seems every time we come up with a program and you're successful, the government cut, <laughs> cuts it. I had seen so many of those. I, I laugh. I says every time you're successful, don't become successful because the government has cut, they'll cut your program. So, so I, uh, then I was fine until the eleventh mission. The eleventh mission, we went to Merzberg. Well, what happened is, you know, the fifteenth Air Force down in Italy had bombed Poletsny, uh, the Romania, the, the big oil fields. The Germans didn't have no natural oil of their own. So they had uh, uh, synthetic oil plants. And it was developed by the Germans, uh, the Lutigy process, where they take the coal and convert it to oil. I don't know why we don't do You, you know, <laughs> excuse me. <laughs> I'm not cynical. <laughs> I just, just ain't that bright. And, and uh, so that's how they were making So the town of Merzburg was their biggest oil supplier where they were converting the coal to oil. And so I got assigned to bomb that place, and they had 800 flat guns there. So when you flew there, it was like flying in the night. You know, you heard the story about that the flak was so thick you could walk on it. Yeah, that was, it becomes night up there, you know, and you got to fly into that. Well, on this particular mission, we were tail end Charlie at that time. So we went into this thing, and at that time, we went into this, and as we went into the target, there was so much flack up there. When we came out, we were lead crew. That's how bad that was. We were lead crew, and every we had lost a lot of planes, but in our in our bomb group, every plane had a dead man or wounded man aboard, except we were the only planes that that that, that. we had about six hundred and fifty holes, but nobody we had nobody wounded or nobody dead. Yeah. Boy, that's that's when I got scared. And before that I was you know, we're doing the job. So that's when for you that was when mortality became became age. real realistic. Yeah, you're right. And uh, you're still what now, age wise? You're. I'm. Se I'll be 78 in July. But I mean, at, at the time. Oh, at the time. Were you 20 by this time? Yeah, I just turned 20. 20. Yeah, so still a yeah. kid. Yeah, still a kid. Yeah. What? When you describe this being tail gun Charlie going in and being the lead plane coming out. Are you aware of anything else going on around you? Are you just aware of, of your guns, your job, and flat? No, you really? see what happens is when you go into the target, you know, you got fighters, and then you got a fighter escort, you know, see? Well, when, you're, when you get on the IP and you're heading into the target, the fighters leave, both the, the fighter escort and the German fighters. They, they, they don't go into that flak. They leave. In other words, they get out of the way. 
and then you're on your own. And you go on, when you're on the IP, you, you, the, the bombardier controls the plane, and it's a straight shot, and he doesn't go up, he doesn't go down, he doesn't go nowhere. He goes, and that's it. That's a steady course. And so you're going through there, see? And there was so much flack up there. I don't know, like a miracle of God. You know, don't forget, there's 39 airplanes. And we were the last, we were the last group, and we were tail gun, tail end Charlie, and we wound up leading, leading the group when we came out of that thing. See, and like I said, we were stood down for three, four days when we got back, those that got back to base. We lost, we lost quite a few ships, and like I said, and I don't know, it was a miracle we didn't have a man wounded or dead on our ship. How do you deal with that when you get back? Well, like when you get back, you go into the debriefing, and they give you a double shot, <laughs> double shot of booze. And believe me, you you need it. And me and my waist gunner, the other guy from Oklahoma, not the not the uh, not the ball gunner, but the waist guy, he's six foot four. He and I were like Mutt and Jeff, and he was from Oklahoma, and I was Philly, and we were like brothers. And uh, th there was uh, two guys that didn't drink, so we used to get there. So so whoever didn't drink. <laughs> Yeah, it was a good shot of boo. It was just, <laughs> you needed it. So, so you the were, hell with this counseling stuff. Just give him a couple of shots. Of yeah, it. yeah. Well, then you know, yeah. See, and and then uh, and then they debrief you. You know what you see in the mission. Now the the waist the ball gunner. Uh, he was colorblind. So we'd be flying, and that guy could see. You know, the Germans had the stuff camouflage, and he could see it. And so the navigator used to have to put it in the log. You know, there were oil, oil tanks in such and such a place. And, and the, the waste cutter used to say, you damn Mexican, if we got to go back and bomb that place, I'm going to kill you. <laughs> and that guy, he could see, yeah, and he could see that stuff. It's interesting. They, they told me that. I'm brown, green color. Oh, you're okay. And they said if I was in World War II, that's what I would have been doing because I yeah, could yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> Glad I wasn't there. Yeah, the people don't know that. That was interesting. Yeah, <laughs> he would he would tell them, the navigator, hey, there's tanks down there or something, whatever you know, whatever he see. <laughs> Is it when when you got back? Was it? I mean, you go to the debriefing and all that, but with all that happened, did you guys talk about what happened? I mean, you're losing a lot of people, and there had to be something. Oh to yeah, do well, yeah, yeah. Or do you, know, you yeah. just—is it quiet? Is it what do you guys? No, talking about? no, you, you. Well, you, you know, yeah, you didn't sleep until you were stood down. When you knew you were stood down, then you were able to sleep, because you didn't know you're going to fly the next day or not, and here you're going to go through, you, you know. And hey, don't forget, there's guys next to you that ain't coming back, so you know they got shot down. So you see it, it, yeah, it, yeah, 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 you know, so. Yeah. Do, you guys, do you guys joke around to try to, I mean, do you just. Cause it no, like we, used to, we used to, we used to go, go to traps and, and, and booze up. <laughs> yeah. how, many, how many days generally between a fly? I know it varies. No, but. sometimes, you, like, like in the beginning there, we were flying one day right after the other. See, then when we came lead crew, then it was weeks apart because you were lead crew. See, which was better, having the time in between? Well, you would have finished up. You see, uh, being lead crew on my time, you got to remember at the beginning in '43, those guys flew 25 missions. There were no fighter escort. You know, our fighters couldn't go that far. It was when the P-51s came along. And then they came up with the belly tanks for the fighters that they could go the distance that the bombers could go. Otherwise, well, like the first Schweinfurt raid, that was suicide. Our, our, our bomb group got slaughtered. And General LeMay led that. I mean, hey, he was, that, that guy was a great general. And then he was over in the Pacific uh, in the 20th Air Force. Then. And, uh, uh, and General Spatz the same way. And our, our uh, General Travis was uh, uh, the 40th Combat Wing, our leader for, our, uh, for the groups that were in his 40th Combat Wing. And he didn't fly no milk runs. He only flew heavy missions, you know. And uh, uh, I never did like General Doolittle. He screwed up the whole thing. They should have kept him over 20 seconds. He should have made it 50 seconds over Tokyo. 
And, uh, you know, he, well, what happened is General Travis, he came out with an order that the tail gunner had to be a, an officer, you know, a bombardier or, or somebody, to keep score. Keep score of what? And so General Travis says, there ain't no officer sitting in my tail. There's going to be a tail gunner there. So my pilot, Captain Healy, he pulled the same thing. He said, no, but only Vince. I flew all the time with him. He says, everybody, I was a hot shot tail gunner anyway, and everybody wanted me to fly with him. But Captain Healy said, no, no. Vince flies with me, only with me. And so I was his tail gunner. And it was funny, but he came up with, with well, you, you know, all these uh, insignificant things. You're, you, hey, chief, you're going to die tomorrow, you know. That was one thing that was different about combat. The officers used to call you by name. Hey, Joe, hey, Vince, you know. Hey, tomorrow you're going to be dead maybe, see. You know, so there was re it was reality, and it was different. So it was nice that way. You, did, you didn't have all this strict discipline. See? Yeah. So on the, on, the, on, the, uh, on the 24th mission, like I said, uh, this was supposed to be, uh, what happened is our intelligence uh, gathered that the uh, the Germans were moving all this heavy equipment. We didn't find this out till after the war, you know. They were moving all this heavy equipment that they were going to get ready for the Battle of the Bulge. And they were moving all of that heavy equipment down to General Ron Rundstedt. So they weren't using the, the big cities, the trains going through the Martian yards in the big city, because we were bombing them all out. We were bombing the heck out of them. I never did understand why we didn't bomb the railroad tracks in the middle of nowhere, you know. <laughs> why we always, yeah, it's, I never did make sense of it. But so what happened is we, uh, it was supposed to be a, a milk run. And what a milk run means, it's an easy mission. Uh, there was no flak, no, you know, we didn't expect no fighters. So we're heading for the target. And you always come out, you know, over to Zyder Z you know, over Holland there, and you're heading into Germany. And uh, so when we got there, there was a, an overcast, and we were above the clouds, so you couldn't see, so we couldn't bomb with the Norton bomb site, which is called visual bombing. We had the radar dome underneath, and the Germans jammed the radar. See? And, uh, and what happened is, we had this new system called the GH system, which was supposed to be a radio-controlled method to bomb, which would give you the third way. Well, that was on the blinks. So when we got to the target, we couldn't bomb. And, the, and the, I argued with the pilot, drop the bombs off the flare of some other group that's already bombed. And uh, the uh, GH man said, no, he said, we got to go to secondary. And it was interesting, the navigator, uh, Norman Stewart, said every time somebody screws up, somebody gets killed. Just like it was premonition. I wrote that up, by the way, I wrote that up after the war. Uh, you, you know, and I thought the pilot should have got a Congressional Medal of Honor. And uh, I wrote that up. And, uh, and so we went to the secondary. We got to the secondary and there were scattered clouds so you could bomb visually. And so they had us zeroed in. So we're starting on the, on the IP, and there was these eight bursts of flak, and we're, in the, you know, five miles away. Next one was closer, next one's closer. And I kept telling the pilot, tracking flak, and there were eight bursts at a time. Well, just as we got to the, dropped the bombs, the uh, bombardier yelled, bombs away, we were on a 20-degree bank. Bang! And the plane went up and down. We got a direct hit. 88 millimeter blew the nose off and you know well I couldn't we couldn't see up front me there was only me and the waist gunner he, uh, Ray Leo and I were the only we, because that radio operator I was going to shoot him one day he always kept that door closed because he got cold you know what the hell we were freezing back there what's he talking about he got cold you know and and I resented that and uh, the radar guy was also in there with your lead crew and so we couldn't see what was going on. So the pilot yelled, bail out. I argued with the pilot, and it's in the records, it's in the log. And I said, we've been through worse than this. We can make it back. 
And he said, you heard me bail out. This is it. So what are you going to do? So I unhooked the flak suit, put on the parachute, unhooked the oxygen and the intercom, and I started for the escape hatch. And when I got there, the waste gunner, the ball, who, the uh, Ray Leo was flying waste. He was hanging halfway in, halfway out. And I thought, oh, boy, he's either froze, stuck, or something's wrong. I'll go up, and I'll either pull him in or push him out. Well, in the meantime, as I started through that, uh, there's, not much, there's not much room there, he went out. So I went back to my position, and I could see out back. I couldn't see in the side because there was all gas and oil. And, but I could see there was a chute hanging on my horizontal, right horizontal stabilizer. And I thought there was a man on there. I figured, well, somebody up front bailed out and got, got caught because the plane was going up and down and got caught in the, in the horizontal stabilizer. And I looked out, and his chute opened. It was open, and he was going down. I said, well, he made it, see? So I just I, I hooked up the oxygen, but I didn't hook up the intercom because I had to take a couple more squigs out because I was off of oxygen too long. And at that altitude, you're off of oxygen, you're going to die. You know, you got to have oxygen. So I took a couple big squigs and kicked out the door, and away I went. And so I was falling down, and we were well, we were well, we were well briefed. You're supposed to wait till you get 3,000 feet off the ground before you open your chute, you know. So you're, you'll never get a thrill bigger than that in your whole life. Don't let anybody ever, I don't care if it's Marilyn Monroe or who it is. That's once in a lifetime. So as I'm going down and tumbling, there's no noise. The stillness, you can't hear nothing. That's how quiet it is. And I'm falling down, and I got thinking, suppose the chute don't open. <laughs> then I have to rip it apart. And so as I'm going down, I got thinking about that. And I, when I give it the first yank, I didn't pull it far enough. It didn't. So then I, and boy, it went, and I got, and there you were, and you're hanging in midair. That's how you're coming down. And it's funny, as you're going through the clouds, it looked like the clouds are going up past you real fast. <laughs> no, that's you going down. And so what happened is a, a, a 109, ME109 yellow nose followed me down. And when I came down, uh, see, we were briefed. When you bail out to slide your chute, you pull on one side of your chute so you don't land in the target area. If you land in the target area, you're dead. They're going to kill you. So you keep trying to, so I kept pulling the chute. Well, I landed maybe 30 miles from the, tar, from the target area. And I was, I was going down in the woods. And what happened is my chute was on the upswing pendulum when the chute caught on the top of this tall pine tree. And I came down. I, I had, a, I had a, 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 a flak wound on the right leg which I didn't even, you know, think about. And I went through that. And then I was left hanging 20, 30 feet in the air. And there were the German, the, the civilians, the burgomaster with the Lugers, come and see here, come and see here, you know, and I'm cursing at them. And, and uh, I couldn't get out of that tree because I could unhook the chest, but I couldn't, I, my weight, and I, there was no way I could get out of that. And I'm hanging out there. So finally, I just rolled over and I hit the ground, and they were on top of you. So then they put you in the barn. Where, where was it that you? Well, two questions. When you bailed out, other than now, you said one plane followed you to kind of yeah, see the where German you fighter. Oh, a German fought, fighter. Followed yeah, Messerschmitt 109. Not firing at you. Just oh no 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 no. We had that was interesting. Let me explain that. There was an unwritten rule between us and the Germans. They didn't do that because if they did that, then when we shot them down, we'd shoot, we'd kill, shoot all their pilots going down. See, see. Except when they went down in Germany, they were back in their own country. See, but we were, we became prisoners of war. See, so no, that was an unwritten rule. You didn't do that. You didn't, you know, you didn't shoot guy in midair, which was was, was made sense. You know, both sides. It was unwritten, but both sides knew. It's one of those kind of surreal aspects of war, though. Yeah. In fact, we're going to shoot your plane down if you die there, but when you're yeah. falling down... Yeah, see, there's, there's something between 
there's something between combat people. There's a, even though they're enemies, there's kind of a camaraderie, you know. You, you understand each other. I'm fighting you, you're fighting me, but that, that's the way it goes, you know. But there's a, some uh, respect in, 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 in that thing, see. So they put me in a barn, and, and there was a 12-year-old kid. He spoke English, and uh, the burgomaster, who's the, 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 the mayor of that little or whatever it was, and uh, they had me up against the wall, and, and so the kid spoke English, and I said to him, we were well instructed, I says, go get me a soldier, I says, go get me a soldier, I said, Nick's Gestapo, he says, Nick's Gestapo, Sudat, I go get you a soldier, I says, go get the soldier so I can become a, a prisoner, you know, I think. Well, in the meantime, the, the, the fraud line, the lady of the house, she brings out a glass of water. She's going to give me a glass, you know, and I got all this gear and all these wires hanging down and, you know. And that mare gave her a foot and a rump, and I must have, she must have lifted her three feet off the ground for wanting to give me a glass of water. Well, 15 minutes, 10, 15 minutes passed by. Here come two guys, Mutt and Jeff, Gestapo, the Gestapo. And they, and all of a sudden, the little guy, you can't never understand them, you know. And, uh, you know, and the little guy gives me a shot right in the eye. Well, he gave me a shot in the eye, and I'm ready to give him a shot back. And the other guy got the Luger sitting right there. So what do you do? You take the shot in the eye. And so then they took me on this parade through the woods with the bicycle, the parachute, and I'm pushing it. And I got flying boots on, no shoes. You can't walk, you can't walk in those. And I'm burning and exhausted. I couldn't breathe no more. I was burnt. My chest was burning, so I just fell down on the parachute. And that guy was beating me with the, with the stick. I didn't bother him because the back was already numb, so you don't feel nothing, and that's fine. Well, then he sharpened the stick, put a point on it, and then he stuck that in the back of your neck. And that drive you nuts. So I kept going, and I couldn't see no more. You know, I, the, the, the eyes were you know, the, so red, you know, from, from burning, you know. And uh, I seen, a, as we going through the woods, you know, we, there was a clearing, I seen a rope. I figured, oh, that's where they're going to hang me. So I figured, oh, so shit, the war's over. I did my job. Well, there was a crossroad. There was a road. And there was a guy, a, a guy, a guy in a green uniform and a bicycle coming and, and we intersect and uh, all of a sudden he jumped off the bike and he started arguing with these two guys. I didn't know. I said, oh God. I said, now this guy's going to beat the beat the crap out of me. And hey, well, 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 you know, they're, they're going at it hot and heavy. All of a sudden all of a sudden he chased them away and he said to me and he takes me with him. Never never struck me nothing. And I figured, well, you know, I knew he was a soldier, see, because I knew he was an infantry guy, a worm mocker, he was Greek. And those two guys were Gestapo, see. So he takes me, they had the, uh, on the rail, and they had four boxcars. They were anti-aircraft uh, guns on them that were mobile. They used to move those for for when they need wherever they needed them for for any aircraft for shooting down our planes, and so it got to this box. I couldn't get up that box car. They had to lift me up there. I was burning, and they put me in a seat. They give me a glass of water. It must be like steam came out, you know. And they didn't bother. They just let me sit there, and then I could see down at the other end. There was my waist gunner. The ball gunner's flying waste, Ray Leal. And Jesus, he was bang I was banged up. He was really banged up. But we could signal uh, funny with the eyes. And, and uh, so I said, uh, so uh, later on, after uh, I calmed down, you know, they didn't say much to me, you know. Uh, they, these were the anti-aircraft guys. And uh, they brought me a little bit of... Um, Wrote it was uh, cabbage, cabbage type German cabbage type, you know, no meat, you know, a little bit. And so at eleven o'clock at night it was dark. Then they came with a car and they took us to the air base, which was uh, Osnabrück Airfield. That was a fighter base. 
and they put him and I in there in in the in the guard. It was a um, the, I don't know, you, you, you would say the office or whatever it was, but it was like a kind of like guardhouse, but that's where they kept us. Well, they picked up two other guys from a B-24, a pilot and a radio operator, and they had them in there. So we just sat there. We were there for three days. And uh, uh, in the morning, the fighter pilot came in, young like us, you know, 19, 20 years old, and they, and they spoke good English. And they talked to us, and they asked, and they said, he said, well, I shot you down yesterday. Well, you didn't shoot us down. You shot the 24 down. Uh, we, we, you know, because uh, uh, the, the waist gunner kept asking me. I said, I bet you they made it back. And he said, how do you know that? And I said, I don't see them. When we got interrogated, you found out. The Germans had every bomb squadron, every group that sing. We were Triangle C. They knew everything there was, and they had all, the only guys they didn't know were enlisted men. But they had knew all the officers, who they were, where they were from, you know, because uh, they had one hell of a spy system. I, I I couldn't believe it. I said, boy, oh boy, what a spy system! Because see, they used to advertise when the guy graduated pilot school. He come from Podunk. Uh, that was in the paper and. I don't know, they, but they had it all. I'll tell you, they knew every bomb group, every squad, so they couldn't classify Ray and I. They had the B twenty four, the the B twenty four guys, but they couldn't get me and him. And I says, I will bet you they made it back because they couldn't, because if our plane went down, they'd have known it was a Triangle C, and then they would know we were the three hundred third bomb group. They would know. See, so, so we talked to the. They were, and it's funny, you know, there was a nice camaraderie between. The fighter pilots, and you know, because they were in combat, you know, they're just like us, they figured they could get killed tomorrow, just like we felt we could, see. And so we were there three days, and it was interesting. The English, the, the Americans bombed at noon. The English bombed at night, you know. See, the English thought we were crazy, and we said, well, you can't see nothing at night. And we were doing precision bombing where the English did pattern bombing. They would pick an area, and then they would just blast. Uh, and that was the firestorm in Hamburg. They burned that town down to the ground. They, they, they bombed, they, they incinerated the whole city. And uh, so uh, the siren would go off, and the airplanes were coming over, the siren going, and they rushed us down to the air raid shelter. Well, yeah, there were civilians down there. There were 250, and here was the four of us, three guards, 250 Germans, legs off, arms off, you know, and I, oh, God. And I used to pray, don't bomb here. If they were to bomb that airport, that, that airfield, we were dead. I said, them guards ain't going to protect us. See? So then at 7 o'clock at night, the English would go over. And the sirens would go off, you know. And then the second sign, you had to go down the air raid. So, well, after the third day, they took us out of there. And then they took us down to um, uh, Dulag Luf, uh, um, um, Frankfurt on the Main. That's where that was the, uh, that was the uh, central prisoner of war place where all the prisoners of war were, were sent to. And we were on a train. We tried to escape. And and just just as we got the window open, the, the, the guards were sitting up there bullshit and whatever they were doing. And uh, the four of us were back here and, you know, we were making, laugh, cutting it up. So the guards says, ah. The one guard said, the other guy, ah, you know, in German, you know, the crazy Americans or whatever. We're trying to open a window. Well, just as we got the window open, the train pulled to the train station. <laughs> and that was the end of that. So... So they took us to Dulag Luf, and then from there they sent us to big prison camp. And I was uh, on a train, and they nailed us in. Well, that night we were in Berlin, and the marshal are in Berlin. Well, what happens when you get there, they take the engine off because our airplanes were strafing the engine and blowing them up. See, so... So here we were, and it's 7 o'clock at night, here the English come and they're bombing. And I said, oh, God, we're dead. 
And we figure that's the end of it. Well, no, what happened is they decided not to bomb the Marshland Yard that night. They were bombing the middle of town. So there was just a little window you could see at, and I could see. And it was funny. Those English airplanes, the mosquitoes and stuff, the, 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 the searchlights would pick up one, and they were tracking it, right, and shooting at it, right? Well, in the meantime, another one crossed it, and the, the light would go like that, and they'd lose them. And, yeah, so. okay, I'm going to stop. Just, i gotta, I got to switch a tape here just a second. All right, so they got you nailed in on the train. Yeah, see, what they would do, what they would do is when they would stop the train, the doors were nailed shut, see? So you couldn't get out. There's no way you could get out. And you, by the way, you, you urinated, you, everything, uh, and you're, you're packed. There ain't no place to, that's how they had you packed in there. And that's how all them Russians and, were dying in those things for days. And, uh, and the guards would take off, see. Then when it was all over, then they would come back. To, but they never opened the train, see. And then, then, so then we got up to Poland, up to Stalaglu 4. And then from the train station, they marched us to the camp. And then they assigned us to barracks. Now, I have a picture of the... Uh, of uh, Stella Glow 4, and I was in compound C, and each compound had 10 barracks, and 10 barracks had 13 rooms, and uh, the rooms, there were 24 guys to a room, and there were two, there were four two-deck bunks. Okay. Now, all they were were just boards, and three slept up top, three slept in the bottom, but there were 24 in and I'd say that room was uh, 10 by 10, maybe, something like that, or 12 by 12. It wasn't very big, see. And there was one latrine, see. And that's where you stayed. So then, you know, you could, they used to take roll call every day. A couple, they never could count right. That used to be a comic. They could count five times. And, and I, used to, I used to think, I thought the German people were smart. And so... You could walk around the compound. That's how you exercise. You know, you go out and walk. And then we they had a little little stove there. And then we used to get the news. We had underground radio. And uh, somebody would come around and give you the latest scoop. So we knew. We'd get it from CBBC. They had a underground radio. And uh, and then the, the, the guy come with a piece of paper. And if the guard come, he either ate the paper or he threw it in a and the what's the name. So I learned to play bridge and you played cards and, and you starved. Uh, you know. So with, there we get in a, a Red Cross parcel f split four ways. But you were always hungry. All you ever talked about was food. And what amazed me is, is uh, uh, in January of, uh, well, the, the Battle of the Bulge occurred. And that, then they, they bring in the, the Volstrom, the German newspaper, and they show that von Rundstedt was going to push the whole Allied back to the sea. And we, and we thought, we're never going to get out of here. We figured that's the end of the world. Because then when, when Patton liberated Bastogne, you know, and we didn't get no more newspapers, so we used to ask the guard, where's the Volstrom <laughs> What happened? What happened to to, to von Rundstedt? See, because we used to talk to them, you know. <laughs> we used to call them all kinds of names. They didn't know what we were saying. It was fun. See, well, we had a lot of Jewish people, and you know, we were all bilingual back then. You got to remember that Italians, Germans, uh, Jewish. You know, we we all had two languages, but the language is English in school. There's a difference. You don't get all this crap you get today, and 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 so you had the the Jews and the Germans that, that could uh, could uh, read German and speak German. You know, and, and, and you know it's interesting. See, so uh, different kind of different kind of people, the generation then. You know, and and, 
And, and it's like I said, they can never count right. <laughs> See, so in January, we were isolated. We were the furthest prison camp east in Germany. See, so there was no 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 activity. You couldn't hear none. No no guns. No nothing. Well, in January, all of a sudden, there's an airplane came over and going. Uh, uh, all that. Oh, that's interesting. The Germans, the English. The Russians, all their airplanes, uh, 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 where ours had a continuous cycle. You know, our airplane, you know, our our equipment didn't do didn't. You you you, you, you or like the English Lancasters, all of them, you, uh, 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 you know, and uh, there's so we looked up and here's this three-engine uh, yak, yeah, yeah, Russian. So we said, the Russians must be close if that airplane's here. Because them Germans would shoot them out, you know, you know, they were no match for the Germans 109s or Falk Wolves. So I said, the Russians must be close. Well, uh, come the end of January, the first week in February, the, the rumors got out that we were going to have to mar march, uh, leave the camp. Because the Russians, we got on CBC, the Russians had crossed the Carpathians. And I tried to explain that to the students, what the Carpathians are. I said, you got to study geography, too. There's the mountain ranges, and the Russians were on the move. And the way the Russians travel, they spearhead, and they lived off the fat of the land. They were not like the American armies. They didn't carry rations and all that stuff. They just killed the cows and eat the cows or whatever and, you know, take, uh, yeah, you know. They just lived off the fat. And the spearhead went first. Then came the heavy artillery and stuff, see. And that's the way the Russians fought, so... We got word that the Russians, so they said, prepare to move. So take whatever you had, your blanket, your, we only had, well, all we had, whatever, we were shot down. And that's the only clothes we had. We didn't have no change of clothes. So if you, if you screwed that up, you were, had problems. And so we made, we made backpacks out of your under, out of your long johns, you know, to make a, that kind of a, uh, a sack to carry whatever you had to to take with, and you had a blanket. Everybody had a blanket, and so on the fifth of February, the Germans decide to move us out, and so they said, "Well, we were only going to walk a couple a couple of days, a baloney, eighty-seven days," and so we started across, going along the Bullock, going going west, and. Churchill, President uh, 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 Churchill, uh, uh, on CBC said <coughs> to us, "Just keep walking. You're walking west. You know, you're making better time. You know." And uh, they knew where we were at. They knew what was going on. They, they, they. Uh, you know, we had that underground radio that kept us posted. And, you know, and where were you going to escape? The woods, all the Germans had guns. The, 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 they called it the Volstrom. That was the land army. Hell, you, you see you, they shoot you, you're dead. You know, so we started. And we were supposed to cross the Oder River at Stettin. Well, we couldn't cross the Oder River at Stettin. The Russians were already there, ahead of us. So we crossed over at Swinemundi. And uh, I'll never forget that first, the second day, I was in a barn, and I was scrounging around, you know, looking around for food. And there was a young Russian girl milking a cow. And uh, and I looked in there, and, and she's saying to me, sh, 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 you know, I couldn't talk Russian, couldn't talk uh, English, you know. I mean, she was signaling me. What she was trying to tell me is, lay down next to the cow, and I'll squirt the milk in your mouth, see? So it finally dawned on me what was she? You know, she kept saying to me, you know, and she got caught that it shot her dead. They they didn't waste no time. They didn't waste no time with those. They they just kill them like it was nothing. And so I laid down there and she was squirting the tit in in, in my out my mountain. She was squirting the milk and yeah, my combine partner when I came back and told me, he says, go down there like if she's still there, go there, lay down and she'll squirt milk in your mouth. And our feet were swollen, and it was 
It was the worst winter they ever had, with 47 below zero. Oh, yeah. We slept in open fields. I thought we'd never make it. And then we stuck. So we got to Swinemundi, and they were transferring us across by barge. So me and my combine partner, and he was from Ohio. He's dead long time now. He was from Cincinnati, Ohio. And so we got across there. Well, when we got on the other side, he and I walked down the block. You know, there was all such confusion. So we walked down. We kept on walking, walked down around the block, and there was a Swedish ship in port, see? So we figured if we could get on that Swedish ship, we could escape, get a stow, be stowaway, and, and then we could get interned in Sweden. Well, we went around, we went down a couple blocks, we went around, we went, just him and I, and we came around the other side. There's a bakery shop, and you could smell the, the bakery, you know, we come up the other side, and there's two German guards there. Los, Los, you know, what are you doing here? You know, they, they didn't know we were trying to get onto that ship, and they pushed us back in the line again. <laughs> so that was the end of that escapade, and, and away we went. Yeah, that was interesting. So, how, how come the Germans went to all the trouble to, to think marching? Because wasn't it a, kind of a pain for them? Well, I mean, there, we, no were, we were or... basically hostage. Uh, see, uh, Himmler wanted to kill all of us. See, Himmler issued an order in February, shoot all prisoners of war. The generals said, you've got to be crazy. You shoot all them people. There ain't going to be a German left alive when you're all done. There'll be every German will be dead. See, so the generals wouldn't, wouldn't listen, wouldn't follow. And they see, you know, they thought he was nuts. He was nuts. Him and Hitler both. So that's why. So we were basically hostages. We we had a value, and what they did, there were ten thousand of us in that prison camp. They moved fifteen hundred out by box, by rail to somewhere else because they had legs off or crippled or they couldn't walk. So what they did is they broke us up into groups of 250, and they separated us four miles apart because they didn't want 10,000 of us all together because they figured that 10,000, especially airmen. Now, see, the airmen didn't have to work. We were, non, we were non-commissioned officer. And according to the convention, we didn't have to work. Now, the infantry guys, they worked on the farms and stuff. They had to work, okay, but we did and so we were a pride. Now the officers were up in Stella Gluf 1 at BART. They were there until the war ended until they got liberated, see. But they were different, you know. Uh, the Germans respected rank or some, for some reason. I, I don't know. You know, old Prussian philosophy, I guess. So, so they kept us in 250s, and that's the way we went across northern Germany, yeah. Starved, hungry, no food. Oh yeah. Are are you still thinking at this point? Uh, the Russians are coming. The war's about over. No matter what, if we keep marching, we're going to make it. Or or what's your well? Morale? Well, the Churchill kept telling us. Oh yeah, yeah. Well, because we knew the army. We knew the Allies were advancing. You know that uh, Patton. That they crossed the Rhine. You know, and Montgomery. See, we were in northern Germany. I got liberated by the Second Canadian Division, see, which was part of Montgomery's. Uh, they were Canadian, so they had us around the three times, and then Germans could walk us right out. I, I, they were clever, because walk us right out from under them, you know. And uh, yeah, you, you, you're right. So, so we knew the war was coming to the end. See, you know, when we got captured, the, Ger the, the Germans kept saying, "Krieg is kaput for us." Well, at the end, they were saying, Krieg is kaput for them. They knew. They knew the end was coming. It was just a matter of time. Because the Russians were already in Berlin, and we walked around the north of Berlin. See, we were up, up north along the Baltic Sea. Because the Russians were already in Berlin. That's how fast they were moving. Yeah. And, and nobody wanted to get captured by the Russians. So on the road... There was all the uh, refugees. You know, when, when you looked at Bosnia and, and you've seen that a couple of year, two years ago, all those refugees, and that's exact. And we were in the midst of that. See? Now, were you all going the same way? Or oh, you, no, 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 because way. nobody wanted to get captured yeah. by the Russians. It was funny. Nobody wanted to get captured, especially the Germans. Nobody wanted to get captured by the Russians. 
they were all heading west to, to get captured by the uh, Americans and the English. That's what I heard. I talked to uh, uh, Frank Walkagents. He was a scout, and he was at Berlin, and they were ready to take Berlin when they said, nope, you got to back off and let the Russians come in. And he said, you know, we thought the Germans were scary, but when you saw the Russians, he said, you could see you didn't want to meet with these. No, that, that's like what Like you said. describe them. Yeah, you know, oh, the, yeah. Because don't forget, look what the Germans did to them Russians. See, that, oh, they, oh yeah, they knew. See, the, the Russians had no... No, there was no humane, no humane thinking. Uh, they they just going to slaughter every damn kraut they found. As far as they was concerned, they were going to kill every German there was. And maybe a few Americans on the way. Well, well you know, no, 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 no. They, they, they were funny. The Russians are good people. You, you know, it, it, the problem was Churchill and Stalin. If Roosevelt still had been alive, I don't think we'd ever had the Cold War. Stalin liked Roosevelt and trusted Roosevelt. It was Churchill, because what Churchill wanted was the Balkans. Don't forget, Romania, Latvia, Czechoslovakia, that was all English influence, see? You know, you also got to remember, uh, before World War I, they were all related. The King uh, Kaiser Wilhelm and Queen Victoria were first cousins, and you know, the whole thing never made sense. See, so Churchill wanted to control the Baltics, and the Russians said, no, 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 no. They came into us, and we're not going to ever let them come to us again. See, so, and as far as the Russians were concerned, Poland is the Carter. They call that the Carter to Russia. See, that's, they did that during World War I, they did World War II. That was the way into Russia was through. Well, Napoleon did that. <laughs> he went the same. Napoleon went the same route. See, so no, that was that, that was all about. And, now you got, which is interesting because we we forget the Canadians were there. You got liberated by the Canadians. Oh, I got yeah, but yeah, yeah. See oh, wow. now, some of the guys, some of the guys went down to hell and they got liberated by the Americans, but we were they got liberated in April. We didn't get liberated to the eighth of May. See, so we went, and we got liberated at Zertin. We were on our way to Holland, see. And, uh, and, and so uh, how did that happen? What was that like? I mean, are you marching, or they got you? Yeah, we're marching. Yeah, you know, who, 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 who knows? Yeah, you know, whichever way they, the German command decide, uh, to, you know, all we kept doing is walking, you know. Huh? Yeah, oh, well, well uh, let me talk about the night before we got liberated, okay? Uh, the Canadians and the Germans were having a, this is at night, they're having a dual artillery duel. And then the, the skies are, you just light up the skies with these lights. And so the Germans were marching us under that. We were in between both of them. And they were walking us through there. And everybody said, don't light up a cigarette. <laughs> he lit up a match, a cigarette. That artillery would have fell right on you. And so they, they, cleverly, they took us right through that. And there was a duel going on. So we, we, were, we were held up. They put us in a barn. And that, that woke up that morning. And... Uh, Whatever garbage I had left, there was, you know, we made little, unique little stoves. It was interesting how they designed those. Clever, clever, clever. So I'm cooking, the, me and my combine partner, we share, and I'm cooking this garbage. And uh, this guy pulls in in the Jeep, the English officer, and he jumps out and he says, you're liberated, Yank. And everybody says, shoot him. They thought he was crazy. See, now, we had, oh, I forgot to tell you. On the first 44 days of the march, we had the SS troopers. And you, they bayonet you, they'd shoot you. So you didn't think nothing of it. On the 44th day, they took them and sent them back to the front. And they gave us all these 70. 70, 75-year-old Germans from World War I, the, the Verm they called them, we call them the Wehrmacht, 
land army. And they, well, they couldn't keep up with us, see? And uh, there was one guy, when we started out with them on the first day, there was a, this little, I used to call him, we, we got the name of Sad Sack. This little German guy, he's carrying two suitcases. And the first four miles, he was, oh, boy, he turned purple. I thought the guy was going to die. He's going to have a heart attack. So I'm on, the, on you know, we're in column to four, we're four, column to four. So I said to him, I took his suitcase. Man, oh man, you never heard such collaborator. Uh, you know, they call me everything under the sun. I said, ah, oh, shit, I said, the guy's going to die. So when we stop for the 10-minute break, <coughs> this guy sits under the tree, and he says to me, come and see here. He opens up the suitcase, and God damn, he got six loads of bread in there, and those those things were two and a half kilos a piece, you know, they were 80% sawdust, you know. <laughs> and he gave me one for, from then on, everybody wanted to carry the guy's suitcase. <laughs> so that made me his, uh, now, yeah, we had to be, you know, so in the morning, they, they, he used to cut the crust from the bread because he couldn't eat it, just didn't have no teeth or something. And so he'd come, and my combine partner, we'd be walking, and he'd go, Shh. That, that was the signal. Because he had to be careful that they didn't catch him, frat, you know, they, that's called fraternization. And he goes, and then he'd take out these, these crusts from the bread, and I'd get them. See, my combine partner said, everybody was envious. Everybody tried to catch in, catch in on the action? No way. Only wince. And he used to call me wince. You know, wits. And so my combine partner and I, that's how I used to get some food. Because, cause, you know, and one time he gave me a piece of pork. Oh, God, that was out of this world. You know, with a potato, piece of, never had a piece of meat, you know. So it was interesting. <coughs> one time we were pulling guard duty. We were in a barn, and he was on guard, the fence. And I was walking out there, and he said, Psst. so I went over, and he said, uh, Hobbins, he's cigarette, and, you know, he's, and he's walking on one side, and I'm walking on the other side. And I said, yeah, he says, he says he's cigarette. He hadn't had cigarettes for five days. So we had six cigarettes left. We used to use that for trading, see. So I go back to my combine partner, and I says, hey, Walt, give me a couple cigarettes. He says, what for? He says, sad sacks out there, got no cigarette. He says, oh, you ain't going to. I said, hey, they're mine too, right? I said, give me two cigarettes. Oh, he's moaning and groaning, moaning and groaning. I says, hey, where are you getting all the food from? Where are you getting all the goodies from? You ain't getting it. I'm getting it. So I got the two cigarettes. I go back there, and I'm walking along the front. And shh, shh. So he's going this way. I'm going that way, and I slip him the two cigarettes. So three days later, we're walking. And he goes, shh. You know, and, and, and Walt always says, hey, here comes your buddy, but Jesus, he gives me two cigars and four, there were Turkish, Turkish cigarettes and two Turkish cigars, and he gave them to me. And I said to Walt, what are you moaning and groaning about? Look, <laughs> you know? So, so that was a nice, so when we got liberated, you know, I said to the, to the, to the sad sack, he said to me, Wince, Krigus Kaput, for him, he knew. See, and he wanted to give me his gun. I said, I don't want your gun, you know. So when this is, so after going through that barrage, we're the, I'm cooking, and uh, this guy pulls up in the, B, B, the captain, the uh, English captain, and he's telling him we're liberating. Everybody thought he was crazy. They said another GI went nuts or something. And he got up on a box. You know, nobody believed that guy. And, you know, and the German guards, didn't do nothing, they're old men, because they knew it was all over. They, they, they just was wondering what's going to happen to them when they, get, uh, when they get captured. And they didn't want to get captured by the Russians. See? No, niks ruski, niks ruski, you know. So, so the guy gets mad and he leaves. Well, two hours later, he comes back. <laughs> Everybody says, where's that, where's that nut coming from, you know? And he says, 
I'm telling you, Yank, you're free. And anybody says, so he says, if you don't believe me, go up over the hill and take a look. So I said to Walt, and I said, you watch the garbage. I'll go take a look at the hill. So me and a couple other guys went up, and we went up over the hill. And holy God, all you could see in the distance was tanks with white stars. And we said, that's, that's it. That's the Allies. And then, and then a little while later, here they come. You could hear the rumble because you couldn't hear yet. You couldn't hear the rumbling yet. But then when they got closer, you could hear the rumble. They pulled in, opened up them tanks, and cigarettes and candy bars. And <laughs> so the, the English opened up the NAFI. And, they, and the, what they did, they said, this, get the hell out of here. And, I, and they said, this is the front line. <laughs> We're fighting the Germans. And they said, we have no way to get you. They had no transportation to transport us out of there. So they said, you have to walk. And get, get back 20 miles. Get out of here, you know? And so we just bought everything and, and, and away we went. And, 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 and uh, uh, it was interesting because uh, we crossed this little creek and here was the Germans coming. And so we thought, uh oh, we're going to get captured again. <laughs> well, no, they were surrendering, see? So they were surrendering. And so finally we got back far enough. And then the English, you know, had these naffies. And they opened this up where they had tea and uh, donuts. And, well, two guys, one guy ate 19, another guy ate 22, and they dropped dead. They, see, and, that, and, and Dr. Cap, Cap, Chaplin, Kaplan, who was our uh, army doctor, he kept saying, you cannot eat. He said, you know, you've been starving all these years. You can't eat. You've got to eat a little bit of time. See, then after that, they used to feed us five times a day, you know, very little. But these two guys, they dropped dead. The system couldn't take it, so the English shut down the NAFI and shut them down. And they kept telling us, and the word was spread around, you cannot eat. You got to eat. So then they, when we got, they took us to Holland. There I flew out in the Lancaster to Brussels, Belgium. From there I went to Namor, France. From there I wound up in Camp Lucky Strike. Camp Lucky Strike, I was there a whole month. They were fattening us up. I had lost so much weight. Uh, and then they were redeploying all the troops because the Pacific War was still going on. So they were moving equipment and stuff to the Far East, see? And so Eisenhower came twice to talk to us. I was right there with Eisenhower. I was in line with him. He ate chow with us. And he told us, he says, you know, you guys are heroes, you know, because everybody was saying, well, you, you turned your eyes in the fear of the eyes of the enemy. Or the infant. Well, this guy, what are we going to do if you've fallen out of an airplane, you know? See, so there was kind of a, a, a POWs, which was not right, see? Don't forget, there was only 147,000 POWs during the whole war. There's only 42,000 of us left. There ain't many of us left. See? And, uh, and so uh, he came twice. Uh, he came the first time. He told us what heroes we were. He said, he said don't, believe, don't listen to all of that nonsense. He said, they didn't come to your house and take you. <laughs> he said, you had to be in the front line. You know, you had to be in the front line. You had to be in combat, you know, you, you, to get captured. See, so you weren't back in the, in the rear. So then this uh, General Yuhu Lear, he was the guy down in Georgia when the uh, infantry guys went on a 25-mile hike. And uh, on the way back in the trucks, they were whistling at the girls, yoo he, he turned around and made them walk 25 miles back. And, and they, so he got the name of Yuhu Lear. Well, he was a three-star general. And he was in charge of the camp. So he was going to get us in shape, close order, extended drill, and all of that, to get ready for combat. And we all sat there and laughed, and we were in tents. And nobody would get out, so he sent down the, the MPs. And everybody sat there and laughed and said, where were you at during the war, you know? So he, nobody would move. So he sent down guards, and everybody says, are you going to make me a prisoner? Prisoner? <laughs> So that you know, there were no they could. so the stars and stripe got a hold of that in the gripe column and they wrote it up in the gripe column. Oh my god. 
Next thing you know, General Eisenhower was back. <laughs> and he got up on that stand and he says, I told you guys, you don't have to do nothing. We're going to try to get you home as soon as possible. And he says, I'll tell you what I'll do. He says, if you guys agree, he says, what we'll do is we'll double you up on the ship. So this way you have a guy sleeping in the daytime, a guy sleeping in the nighttime, the same bunk. And he says, and we'll get you home, and, and, you know, and if it says if it's agreeable with you. And that's what I did. I came back on a hermitage. I had the, I had the, the night sleep, the day up, so that was good. And uh, was uh, 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 Lee, Leal, was that his name? Uh, that was, Ray Leal? Yeah. Was he with you all the time? No, no, no. You no, guys got no, separated. You got separated. Yeah. Yeah, yeah see. That's how we found out all the information at Camp Lucky Strike, what happened. That, and I was right. And he, Leo said to me, he said, you're right, Vince. He said, they, they made it back. He says, you were right. How did you know? You know. And I said, well, I didn't see them, did you? You know. And did, they made it back. Did you have any contact with your, dad, with your parents during this time? Could you get no, letters? Or no, 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 no. My parents didn't know until after I was liberated. What did, what did your dad think when you came home? He must have been. Well, you know, my dad knew. I was a different kid. My dad could see that right away. He says, hey, we sent this kid. I was a nice Claudine asked my older sister what kind of guy was Vince. And she says, before he went to serve, he was the nicest kid you ever met. He smiled. He was pleasant. He was respectful, kind, a nice kid. She said, boy, but when he came back, <laughs> oh, yeah, I used to go in and out of the porch every five minutes. My mother said, say, what can I do for you? And I said, you know, you've seen that in the movie, you know. My father used to say to her, leave him alone. My father knew. He said, you sent this kid away. This is what they sent back. Yeah, my father was very understanding. My mother used to get all excited. What could I do for what could I, you know? She couldn't help me. She didn't understand that she couldn't help me. And I used to go to the psychiatrist twice a week at the Philadelphia Navy Yard, Naval Hospital. Uh, we were in bad shape. How, how long did that, or, do, or does it still to today hang on, effects of Oh, that? yeah, yeah. All, all, those, all those POWs. That's Claudine, she could tell you. Yeah, yeah, we never, never. Once you, it's hard to explain to people when you see them dying people dying next to you, you know, death all around you. Like I said, you look at that Bosnia thing and, and those refugees and the struggle. And, uh, what's interesting is you pick up so many senses that you don't have. I could pickpocket the German guard without them ever even knowing. That's how, that's how clever you get. I had this sense I could tell when an airplane was coming. Well, why don't you say, how the hell do you know that? I said, there are airplanes coming. See, I don't know. I guess like the animals. You know, the animals have these senses that we don't understand. How do the animals know? See, whatever these senses are. And, and you don't have them now. You know, they're gone. You don't have them now. But you pick this thing. Well, you're, you're starving. You're trying to. All you're thinking of is survival. Are you going to make it? Because we thought we'd never make it back. We, we figured it, you know, it was all over. See? See? So, are, are there certain things today, a smell or a thing that triggers in your mind, uh, brings back a memory of, of being in the camp or anything like that? Oh, I've heard yeah. people in military, they say they smell an old cot and they go, oh, boy, I remember. <laughs> The only thing I can't take is Colorado. <laughs> and what? TV news? The news on? Oh, yeah. Yeah, that, 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 you know, when I see this stuff going on over there, you know, and I feel so sorry. You know, I, I get so mad. The media is killing us. I, 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 I think the media is doing an unjust service to the American people. You get these guys on there that's supposed to be uh, important people, and they talk about the people fighting for their freedom, like them in Afghanistan. And I said, that guy don't know what he's talking about. <coughs> How could they be fighting for freedom 
when they don't even know what freedom is. What are you fighting for if you don't know what you're fighting for? That, that's the part that bothers me. And I said, you've got to be stupid. And, they, they, and, these guy, and these guys are on TV, you know. And that's why I wrote that thing, what does it mean to be American, American? I said, you, we have to thank our forefathers, George Washington, Thomas Jefferson, Adams, Frank, Benjamin Frank. I come from Philadelphia, where, where everything happened, you know, the Constitution. And they gave us the, con and I, I tell that to the kids, I says, they were brilliant men, and they were wealthy, and they were willing to give up their wealth and their lives to give you the freedom that you got today, and they gave you the Constitution you got today, which they were intelligent and well-educated men, which is based on Roman and English law. That's what our Constitution is based on. Like the Romans knew what they were doing. Like this thing today, you got to follow, go back and study Roman history. Go in there, take the place over and say, the Romans went in, they say, you want to be a Roman or you want to be a slave? Make up your mind. That's what we ought to be doing. Do you want to be free or you want to be, uh, you know? And, and, uh, and uh, this is what I explained to the kids. And then I talk about what happened with uh, President Jefferson. I said in 19, 1803, uh, Napoleon was having the, uh, the, Neapol uh, the uh, Napoleon Napoleonic Wars, and he was in Russia. I said, and guess what? He, you know, he was breaking up the feudal system. He was trying to break up the kingdoms, the municipalities, and the, you know, and he had a hike of a following. He, he made a mistake when he went into Russia. The, the, three, the three generals of Russia, yeah, January, February, March, <laughs> destroyed him back that, that coal. You, I'll tell you, you, you can't move in that coal. And I said, and so he was short of cash so he went to President Jefferson, and he sold them the Louisiana Purchase, which I showed you on the map, for $13 million. And I showed the kids, and that's why I got that map, and I showed them what, what it got, all the way to Montana, you know, up through Missouri and color, part of Colorado. And, and I said, and then all the rest of the stuff over there was, was uh, Spanish. And I said, and the Spaniards were trying, and then he initiated the Lewis and Clark Expedition, and when they went across, the Spaniards tried to stop them, but the Lewis and Clark outbeat them and got to the West Coast. I said, then a little while later, I said, uh, the Nicholas II, the Tsar of Russia, he got caught in a crap game playing poker, and he got caught, and he, and he lost his shirt, so he had to have money. So he sold Alaska to Schwartz Folly, I said, for three million bucks. I said, how would you like to buy Alaska for three million? And I said, you know, realize the size of a mass Alaska is a third of the size of the United States. And I said, for three million bucks. <laughs> and, you know, and then I tell the kids about the war and what's involved and why you have to fight for freedom, you know, and, and uh, you have to get well-educated and, you know, good citizens and you know and I explain all this then I tell them about what happened during the war that's the hardest thing because I ask them um, <clears throat> when we started working on this project with the vets and and part of it was as they said we want what happened told them in our in our words we don't want it somebody else's theoretically telling what happened in World War II we want it in, in our words and we started talking about well classes and teaching students and all that because like we have one gentleman a very nice gentleman but he would like teachers to spend three years teaching world war ii well it doesn't happen that long in school unfortunately so i came down and i said what is it that we want students to know if we can bring it down when they get done learning this what do we want them to leave with what, what, what do you think from World War II? Well, see, what I tell the kids is why it's so important. I said, you got to realize we were a different generation. You know, Tom Burkow wrote that book, The Greatest Generation. I said, you got to understand that we were in the Depression. And the American people, well, I said, take a look at, if you get to see those old films, take a look at them women, my mother, those arms were... We're like men. I said, 
we were tough. We weren't trained, but we were tough. So all they had to do was train us in, 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 during World War II. But as far as being tough, that we already were from the Depression, coming out of the, trying to come out of the Depression. And I said, and what, what my main point to them is, you are the future of this country. And to maintain the freedom, this is the greatest country in the world. I don't know why in the hell everybody else just doesn't say, why don't you give us your constitution? Because it's religion, religion is a detriment in a way. These, these rulers that control the control, and, and that's, that's bad, see? <coughs> and everybody should be following examples. Say, why can't we be like the United States? Look how happy everybody is. And I said, and you kids are the forefront, the bulwark of the future. Uh, you're the ones that are going to have to defend this country because there are always the enemies opposing us. And you're the ones that are going to have be the come the the future me. You know, and and we should have a strong military. We should have the strongest military is, and 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 uh, I think they ought to go back to the draft, uh, compulsory military training. I think every kid should have to spend a year or two in a service so he could get uh, uh, disciplined, uh, uh, experience, uh, uh, a whole lot of things, and he could get a better handle on his future life. And that's what I think, and that's what I tell the kids. And I got a lot of kids, like those kids at St. Joe, they want to go into the service, and I tell them, get good grades, and, you know, if you get a high enough score, you can get... I had a daughter <coughs> that had an appointment, had an offer for uh, West Point or the, Na or the Air Force Academy, and she didn't want no part of it. She was anti-military. And then I got a card from Maxwell Air Force Base wanting her... She got a high SAT score, wanting her uh, ROTC. And uh, I got the card, and I had the card. She came home. I said, sign. She said, what did you say, Dad? I said, sign. Well, three months, she went to VPI, Virginia Polytechnic Institute. Three months after she was there, you think she was General Eisenhower. But before that, they were all anti anti And that's what I'm trying to tell the kids. Because this is the injustice the media does. See? Like that Vietnam thing. I tell them, there's a place we should have never been. Because I'm a World War Tour. And Ho Chi Minh was our ally. He was fighting with General Joe Su, well, fighting the Japanese, the, 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 the Burma marauders, and, and that was the worst fighting there was. And, and it was the French, always the French, you, you know, and I could never understand why. I, said, I still say if Franklin Roosevelt was alive, that would have not been a colony. He would have he gave... Uh, 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 What's the name? His, uh, his his freedom, uh, Ho Chi Minh. He was our ally. I mean, how could you go against you? you? You know, you're first on my side, now you're against me. Yeah. Do you? And this is interesting because, um, and I, I think I might know the answer to this. And this is a tough one. Let's see if I can phrase it correctly. Do you believe in war? Uh, it, that is not the problem. War occurs because of the people. The, 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 the people, uh, you know, it's like I said, freedom. We don't, know how, we don't know how lucky we are that our forefathers, Washington, and them guys were willing to give up their life and their wealth to give us what we got today. If it wasn't for them, we wouldn't have what we have today. Some dictator... See, I try to explain them that during the Depression, we came so close to becoming communist. That was a big movement then. Thanks to Franklin Roosevelt, that he became president. And he was a rich man. And he stuck up for the little guy. He'd done so many things. If, if they just go back and open the book... And follow what he did, and you follow what he did for the American people, you don't have the problems you have today. The Social Security and, and, and all of that stuff. And now they want to change it. And now they got, uh, you know, this Lyndon Johnson, Health, Education, and Welfare. They should abolish that agency. 
They should leave it to the states. I came from Pennsylvania. We had a heck of a good school. So did New York and so did New Jersey. If you went to school in Altoona, it was the same school in Philadelphia or in Pottstown or wherever. And we had one, one head of the school. And I said, the problem started when they got all this PTA. That's when all the problems started. You got <laughs> Yeah. And, and the war, the reason for the war is, is because there's always somebody trying to get control. See? And, and then they want to subjugate. And the only way you prevent this is like the United States. If you have the people who are willing to fight for their freedom and say, no, no, we don't want it. You know, see, and and you you, you, you got to look at those guys that are in the head, and and if if they ain't singing the right tune, you got to get rid of them. And now that's what's happening all through the Arab world. It, it's religion. It's religion, and they're they're raising these youth to become like Hitler used. You got to remember, Hitler used the youth. That's where he gained his strength. He gave out all this propaganda. He got the youth. Once he got the youth, the older people had no, just like our youth. Our, we don't have no control over our kids today because you can't give that kid a shellacking for being bad no more. I got plenty of shellacking. I never got hit for nothing. But when I did something wrong, and, and I'll tell you something, don't give me that. It ain't, it ain't abuse. When my father gave me a spanking with that strap, that sting hurt. I don't, I don't want to get that strap again. I listened to him. And, and, and I don't mean that you have to kill him, but you have to have no control over it. And then the kids, well, I'll go get a lawyer. And it's, you know, it, it, the whole thing is, you know, and the mother, my mother and father, I couldn't go to my mother and get something. She said, did you ask your father? What did he say? No, well, no, it is. You know, and I couldn't go to my father and say, you know, and, and see, they were in unison. I couldn't work one against the other. And the, the, what the kids are doing today, you got 50% divorcees. So the kids are using the parents. What I can't get from dad, I'll go get from mom. Or stepmom or stepdad. See, and, and or... like, what I'm trying to tell the kids, cause there are a lot of nice kids in the lectures I give. <clears throat> I got some beautiful letters. There's a couple letters where the kids, one was a girl said, she wanted to thank me for giving the lecture, and she said, for being brave and fighting for the country. She said, and how were you able to do that not knowing whether you would come back alive or not? I said, boy, that's pretty damn deep moving. And I got a couple of them. Then I got another letter from a kid, Mexican kid, over at the uh, Sandstone in, in, uh, in uh, Hermiston. And he said, he come from Mexico. He says, we never, they never tell us about wars, he says. And he thanked me for, this, for, the, for the presentation and all of that. And he says, I'm thankful that you showed me what it was all about. And he says, I want to know more. And then I had kids over St. Joe's that want to, be, want to go into the service. And I tell them, get good grades. And then you could get an ROTC or maybe you can get appointed to to one of the academies or something. I said, but you got to get good grades. And see, the problem is, when I went to school, I had four years of history, four years of math, four years of science, and four years of English. And there was no nonsense. They don't teach history no more. They give them one quick glance. See, so the kids are confused. See, and my point is, where did it all come from? What do you have today, and who gave it to you? It was our forefathers. And we were so lucky. See, I, the only other people I think of is the Romans. The Romans knew how to rule. They ruled for 700 years. They knew what they were doing. And, and you were free. And under the Romans, you have to admit, you were free. You, you know, you, when they captured a place, you want to be a slave or you want to be a Roman, you know? But the Romans were free people. And they weren't hung up on religion. I mean, you couldn't say nothing against Jupiter, but that was all. But otherwise, you didn't have to belong to a church or, you know, or you didn't have that problem. And the trouble is that these people uh, control. That's where it's bad, when they get control. And this is what our politicians are doing. See, that's where the question about war came from. When we first started this project, the, the powers that be in the school said, 
oh, these vets just want to glorify war. And I haven't met a vet that ever has wanted to glorify no, war. No, no. But like you yeah. said, sometimes yeah. war has to happen yeah, because, because of these other yeah. issues. Yeah. That are there. It's yeah. not we want war. You, you take a look. You take a look. Let me give you a good example. Take a look at that Palestine, the PLO, and the Jews. Now you realize... Uh, uh, my opinion is what they should have done is they should have gave him a hunk of Germany to the Jews afterwards and say, that's, that's your, instead of, but they gave him a, well, the English and, and Truman and them, they gave him a hunk of the desert. They gave him a, you, you know, don't forget, they've been fighting for 5,000 years. Well, the, the Arabs are against that. But what they don't look at is, look what those Jews did with that desert. They took that piece of land and they made it uh, 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 fruitful, uh, 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 productive. Productive. Look what they want. Can't the Arabs say, "Hey, why don't you show us how to do that?" They, they got so much land. There's so much desert over there. So much land over there. Uh, that's what bothers me. So, so when they had the '67 war, they wanted to annihilate. The Jews, okay, and the Jews kicked their fannies, and look, look, they took the sign. And the smartest man they had was Andre Sadat. I loved that man. He was a smart man. He went to Jerusalem with uh, Goldie Meyer, talked to her. He got the whole Sinai Peninsula back without firing a shot. See, what's wrong with the rest of them? See, Syria. When General Shalom was in Beirut heading for Damascus, Ronald Reagan stopped him. He should have let him go. If he'd have went to, to Damascus and pointed them guns there, that guy Assad would have off, or get off the pot. See? See? Now, he's got, he's got, look at the relationship he has with Jordan. They get along fun, but now the, there's troublemakers in Jordan trying to stir up yeah. And, and they, he has the, the Jordan people, he had, that's a good relationship. Why don't this Arafat say, hey, come on, let's cut this nonsense out. Can we work together and you help us to build our economy, help us to, to, to do things? Why we always shoot, why we kill it, why we doing suicide? They, they, they don't want to. See, they want to annihilate Israel and they ain't going to. See, I'm, I, I'm sorry, you know, some people say, I agree with General Shalom. The only answer I see is what he should do, in my opinion, what he should do is just go and take the whole damn thing over and say, now, okay, all of you guys that want to be free are free. All of you that don't, there it is, we're going we're gonna to incarcerate you someplace. I, I mean, there's, a, there's no, there, because along with that hatred, they don't want peace. And then it's all our oil money that is supplying. That's what makes me mad. Saudi Arabia, it's all our oil. And, and what bothers me is, what part does our big oil companies play in all of this? You know, the, it used to be Aramco. Now it's OPEC. That's baloney. It's still Aramco. OPEC is just an excuse. They say now that the Arabs are in charge. Maloney, it's still... Exxon and Mobil and Standard Oil and British Petroleum. Yeah, well, and, and that's where, again, you go to where some things don't change, you know. Uh, yeah. Fuel, you know, ancient yeah. times. Of same, water, way, but... same way with Iraq. I did not agree with Colin Powell and George Bush, <coughs> George Bush because we listened to the UN. We ought to get out of there. We ought to send it to Moscow. Send it somewhere else. Get it out of New York. We don't need it. You got 135 nations in the UN, and 130 are against us. Well, I was going to say that. Yeah. I don't care what you say. The 130 are against us. So what are we doing? Why are we supplying them? Tell them pick up your bags and go somewhere else. That's what we should do. And and yeah, you know, you know, the the, the whole the whole thing don't make sense. What's uh, from your time in the service? What, what, what was the most important thing that you think you learned from being in the service and serving our country? Patriotism. 
what a great country this is. We could beat anybody. You know, when they interrogated me, they, you know, the German uh, interrogator said to me, why are you fighting us? He said, well, I said, well, France, England had to go to war with you because you were fighting them. I says, we American, we just like to fight. We don't care who we fight. <laughs> I mean, you know. Yeah, I, I thought it was terrific education myself. You know, uh, um, you were well trained, you were close, you were fed, you were disciplined, you had to follow orders. Um, terrific experience. Oh God, I moved every three months. I, I could have never seen the places I seen, you know. Wound up in Salt Lake City <laughs> when we picked up our crew in the middle of the winter, you know, it didn't feel far. Yeah, you know. What, what did you do right when you got out, when you got home? I was on a 5220 club with everybody else. <laughs> you know, President Roosevelt had passed the GI Bill, and then he gave, he got $20 uh, a week for 52 weeks. You know, the, 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 they were supposed to re-employ you where you were, you know. They, then you went to work. And then I went to work, and, you know. I went back into tool and die making. And then, well, I always wonder, see, see, when I was in eighth grade in junior high school, I wanted to be an astronomer. I was really st stuck on astronomy. But in them days, to be an astronomer, you had to, an astronomer, you had to be a millionaire. The, you know, not, now with the space age, anybody could become, can get into that. But in my days, you couldn't. So my teacher, eighth grade teacher, boy, I was really hot on that stuff, see. So I always wanted to be an astronomer, scientist. Uh, and that, like my father said, you're going to finish high school for as long as it's for free. You, you know, I, I, if, if other parents in the neighborhood, they made their kids quit and go to work so they can bring home the books. My father said, no, we'll starve, but you're going to go to school, which was smart. And we got, I got jobs in there. Every nickel I made, I used to turn over to my mother. Oh, yeah, I used to huckster. I did all kinds of things, and I'd take the money home, and I'd give it to Mom. You know, and that's how we survived, see? And then when I got working, I turned over my paycheck to my mother, and then she'd give me spending money, you know, and, uh, yeah, you know, and uh, other kids. Uh, huh? So, so uh, I, I started, as soon as I got out, I got out in December 45 and 46, uh, in that spring, I signed up at the University of Pennsylvania. I couldn't sit still five minutes. So I said, what the hell am I going to college for? You know, I, I, can't, I, I can't hack it. I can't, you know, I, you know, I, I ain't going to. So I dropped, I stopped. And then I did the tool and die making. And, and I was the highest, me and my older brother were the highest paid tool and die making in the city of Philadelphia. We were, we, were, we were good. I, well, we were well-educated. So I always wanted to go to college, see? So it took me five years with that psycho when I was getting treated at the Naval Hospital in Philadelphia. It took me five years to calm down enough. And I was working at the Frankfurt Arsenal, and I was uh, uh, head of the uh, artillery. I had five machinists working for me. I was tool and die maker, and I had all these machines and all that. And so... I went to the manager and I said, how do I get a job like you, you know? Uh, he said, well, you got to go to college. What happened is a machine broke down on me. Uh, Britton Gridley, I had a six spindle. We were, we were making 75 millimeter shells. And, and this one machine, the, the pin in the spindle kept shearing on me. And I made several of them. I, I made them tool steel. I hardened them. They still sheared. So after about four times like that, I, I said, there's something, you know, I called the company, I said, there's something wrong with this machine, you know, why does it keep happening? Because I had six others and I didn't have no problem. And so they sent down these two engineers from the Frankfurt Arsenal. So they came down, they said, let me see your pin. So I showed them the pin. They says, oh, it broke in shear. And I'm, <laughs> you know. <laughs> What's your, I ain't an engineer, I'm, you know, I'm a machine tool die maker. So they explained it to me, and they said, well, you see, and they took a look at the, uh, at the grain, the grain, and, the, you know, and I, says, oh, I said, how do you learn all of that? He says, in college. 
by. So I go upstairs, I talk to the manager, and I says, hey. So I called up my uh, counselor, high school counselor, and I says, hey. He says, well, you can go to any college you want, Vince. You were top of the class in high school. He said, go anywhere you want, where you'd like to go. He says, what I'd recommend is you go back down to Central High School and take some refresher courses and stuff, and that's math and whatnot, and I did. And uh, so uh, I went to this, to this boss, and I said, uh, I'm, I got to go to college. He said, you're going to what? I said, I'm going to go to college. He says, you know how much money you're making? I said, I had two uncles. The one uncle thought I was nuts because, you know, I was uh, 27, 26, 27 years of age. He thought I should marry. I got a good job. I should marry, get a house, get a wife, get kids. And I had this other uncle, Uncle Louie, right? And he says to me, no, Wentz. He says, you got that kind of brains? You go. And he was for me, see? So, so you know, it was, it was, it was awful because I was making big, big money, you know. And I used to turn it all over to my mother. And she gave me spending money, you know, because my father had died. And I, was, and I had my sister at the Women's Medical College, you know. And, and then I had my younger brother. He was still in high school. And, you know, so I basically was the head of the household, you know, things. So, so that's what I did. And so uh, we picked Purdue, and I could have went to Clemson or I, mean, I could have went anywhere. And the reason we picked Purdue is I said, I can't go to school in Philadelphia, Penn, Temple, Villanova, Drexel. And he said, why? Because I got all these girlfriends I'm running. I'm running free broads at night. I'll never make it. I got to get away and go somewhere else. And that's, so that was far enough away. And I figured, well, Indiana. And it was a good choice. And still on the GI Bill? Did you? I went, yeah, I went on yeah. the GI Bill. Yeah. I was at the end of that five, I was right at the end period. Yeah. Wow. And so I went on a GI Bill. <laughs> and majored in? In mechanical engineering. Wow. Yeah. So, yeah. That's great school. Gee. Still a tough school. They didn't lower their standards. You can't hack it. There you go. That's, there's a couple of them still that way. Uh, Rensselaer, New York, yeah, Cornell. Well, I could, you could just imagine your dad, if he's still alive, how oh, proud he would be that man. he finished high school. My and... dad would have been so proud. My dad always thought I was, I always respected him. I I had, you know, he was not demanding. He was psychic. So when, one time, uh, you know, you know, when I was running around, I was going to go to a dance at St. John. He said, "Where are you going?" And I was, yeah, I got all dressed. You know, I used to get dressed up, for, you know, and then every day she used to get dressed up in a suit and tie, and that was nice, you know. And where are you going? I said, "I'm going to St. John's." Uh, he doesn't even know where St. John's at. He said, "Where are you going?" I said, "Going to dance." He said, uh, "Don't go." I said, what's the matter, Pop? He says, I got a feeling. He says, don't go. He said, go to movies. And I figured, well, he never asked. You know, he never, you know, I said, that, that little request, what the hell, I could have bought I said, So I went down to the corner. You know, there's 300 guys hanging on a corner, you know. And I said to my buddy, well, let's go to the movies. That night they had a riot at that place. <laughs> Honest to God, I said to myself, how did he know? <laughs> I'd have been in the middle of that thing. Yeah, they had, oh, they had a battle galore. And I said to myself, so I always respected my father. I said, he just couldn't read or write, but boy, he, he was psychic. You know, so he didn't, and he always, he always wanted me to try. I wanted to start a business. He says, try. My mother says, you got a good job. My father says, try. There's a, that's the difference. Yeah, at that time, they were building houses like they are, like mad today. And they were doing hardwood floors. So we had a house that had hardwood floors. And we re-sanded, we redid the floors. So I said, hey, that's a good business. So there was a German, there was a German, guy, German guy, you know, you know, they were all, that, that, that was in the, uh, in the floor business, you know, sand, sandpaper and machines and stuff. So I went to him. And I says, hey, uh, uh, how's chances? Of, he says, that's a good idea, kid. He called me kid. He says, I'll help you. He says, uh, machines, all of that stuff. I'll share with you. 
So I got these buddy of mine, you know, I had a junky car, but I had a car. And I says, hey, they're building all these houses. We'll get to do the sand. As long as you put up the money, nobody else wanted to contribute, you know. And so that went, you know. But that was, uh, you know, but my father tried. And then I had a machine shop. And at that time that I had, that's when everything was, was, in, <laughs> was in a recession. <laughs> and so what happened is I went to Quaker City here in Philadelphia, you know, looking for, for contracts. And they said to me, we're not jobbing anything out. They said, but you know what? <laughs> we could use you <laughs> in the shop, so I got a job. <laughs> It was interesting. <laughs> One thing, you, you, you know. So my mother said, you had to have a job, you know, because she had to have money. And she says, you got to have a job. And so I wound up with a job instead of, and I had bought these machines, you know, GI Bill. You know, I, I bought these lathes and stuff. I had them down in the basement, see. Uh, you name it. <laughs> but what I try to tell the kids is, they are the future of this country. And if they want to, this country to exist as they know it, they are the, going to be the backbone. And I'm sorry that they may even have to go to war like we did. We weren't looking for war, but that's the consequence of maintaining your freedom. If somebody's going to infringe on your freedom, you have to stand up and fight for it. And that's the only answer. Thank you very much. Well, thank you for listening Can to me. Can I get you on my